Access Live with Kevin Rankin. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me on All Access Live. I'm here in the sunny banks of Ellesmere Port in uh, just north, uh, just south, actually, of Liverpool, England, on tour with the Flock of Seagulls. And during that tour, I got to meet my next guest and have a lot of stuff to cover. But before I do, I want to ask a few things. Number one, there's a link below. If you're watching this on any other platform other than YouTube, please go to youtube.com slash All Access Live with Kevin Rankin. Click the subscribe button and then the like. And if you click the bell, you'll be notified about all of my future guests. And you can go back through the 240 some other episodes that I've had in the last year and a half during the pandemic. Now, I have a few sponsors that I'd love to thank. My sponsors at Five Star Guitars have been bringing you the show since early on. They are based in Beaverton, Oregon, which means that if you're ordering online, there's no sales tax. So go to fivestarguitars.com slash all access live and click the promo code of all access 15 and you'll save 15% on top of the fact that you'll pay for no sales tax. So you're going to save a bunch of money and you'll be supporting a local organization that has supported me. Also, the best drum shop on the West Coast of the United States, Rhythm Traders has been around for over 30 years. If you go to rhythmtraders.com, you'll find all sorts of drums and repairs and lessons from professionals. If you tell them that you came from me, they'll give you an extra 10% off. And again, since they're in Oregon, if you order online, you'll pay no sales tax. Finally, Music Millennium, the greatest vinyl shop anywhere in the world, is based again in Oregon. If you go to musicmillennium.com, you'll find the greatest selection of vinyl, all sorts of new releases and old, many of which uh, produced music, which has featured direction from my next guest. So I will set this up and let you know that this gentleman happened to be at my show in London a couple of days ago, and uh, we just got to talking, and I realized that not only does everybody on the planet have a story, but this guy in particular has one that will fascinate you. So uh, all the way from London, England, I've got Ian Eames here. How are you doing, sir? I'm great, thank you. How are you? I'm wonderful. I, so you are in London right now, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, well, um, I live. That, uh, when we talked the other day, um, it happened to be, <laughs> I didn't mention this in the setup, but it happened to be at a pizza joint. So if Lock of Seagulls was playing at a Pizza Express sort of dinner theater style, and you were right yeah. up next to the stage with uh, yeah. with uh, Mike Score. So you and the Flock of Seagulls, you go back quite a ways then, it sounds like. Yeah, I, the, the Flock of Seagulls is very important to me because in, I think, I think the album came out in 83, right? Or around there. 81, yeah. But, 81, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I must, I've been playing it for two years then, in which case. And uh, I was, you know, what, why it means so much to me is because in 83, I was nominated for, uh, I say, I'm going to blow my trumpet. I haven't even started yet, but I was nominated for an American Academy Award for a short film I made called Goody Two Shoes. And um, I was flown, you know, by Paramount Pictures to LA. And I, I think it was a Sony Walkman then in those days. So I, right. I listened to Flock of Seagulls all the way there and all the way back, you know, so it really locks into that moment in time for me. You know, uh, having listened to it that much, then that must have been why you were so intently watching my drumming. <laughs> when I first reached out to you, I noticed that uh, you were right up in front against the stage, but you watched me. And I thought, when I came over and approached you, I said, you've got to be a drummer, right? Because usually it's drummers... staring eyes, Kevin. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I told I've got, you know, these piercing eyes. But um, rhythm, you know, and I don't know whether the audience know much about my you know, what I do and my past, but, you know, I began filmmaking as an animator. So I, you know, so to me, um, every frame, every, you know, every second, it counts musically. I'm aware of it because when you, when you make an animated film, you make, you know, you're in those days, 2D hand drawn, it was 24 frames per second, you know, so it was all very precise. So I kind of, I'm very into, I won't say the precision of rhythm and, and drum tracks, but I, it's just, I don't know, I suck it in. I, I love the, 
the thing about music that's so stunning, and I, it's like just when I'm watching you all play together, is how syncopated you all are. You haven't got your music in front of you, but it, you know, it's you lock in. You're absolutely, you're not exactly machines, but you are, you know, second microsecond perfect as a group of. And for me, that's fascinating to watch. So if I was looking concentrated, that's what I was looking at. And I, I know that the drummer, or at least I think the drummer, drives the rhythm of the song. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so for me, that's completely amazing. And I did, you know, I did I, I, for you guys out there, I've already said he is an amazing drummer. I just want to lay that one down now. He hasn't asked me to say it. I've just said it. Yeah, I'll be sending you checks. Don't worry about it. The, uh, um, I'm glad that you tie that in because um, I have also asked, as I mentioned to you before the show, a dear friend of mine who happened to be a rival drummer friend of mine in high school and became an inspiration to me. We got to be great friends in college, and he's gone on to a filmmaking career, um, mm -hmm. greatly inspired by the work that you've done. And uh, so he happened to jump in here. I'd love to uh, to introduce you to a uh, dear friend, Ken Glenn. Ken, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. Yeah, nice to meet you, Ian. Uh, it's a, oh, it's a real Ken. honor to get to meet you. Yeah. Ken, he is, he is. A green screen. Does that mean we can pop you into some kind of science fiction landscape? There? That's right. Yeah, maybe some Mandalorian background or something. Huh? <laughs> a pink yeah. animation. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's. I tried to do that a little bit here in the background. Let me see if I can get to, this. Looks a little bit more of your, your style. How's, how's that working out there, Ian, nice. in the backdrop? And uh, and that's then great. Got, yeah, yeah. Then we got. Then we got okay. uh, some of this. There's some of this. Guy. Let's see. No, we don't want those. But but perhaps. Uh, We've got, uh, I stand with Ukraine. Does that work okay? Well, we, that's we, important. We'll, yeah. we'll, be, we'll be here yeah. in the studio with Heather Thomas or perhaps uh, at the Rainbow having a piece of pizza in Los Angeles. So, <laughs> um, um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mentioned uh, the backdrop of Ukraine there. That unfortunate uh, circumstance of, of the invasion of Ukraine happened right at the beginning of our tour. And yeah. uh, as, a, as an earmark in time, it's tragic, and it it uh, it absolutely crushes me as we're out, you know, looking at the devastation. Um, yeah. You know, Ian, um, here in the in the UK, I've talked to a lot of people who have uh, brought. It, they've they've mentioned that a lot of refugees are being brought into the UK right now, and uh, a lot of families, um, their husbands and wives are going out to help with refugees in the in uh, in the the conflict right now. Yeah. Um, you know, as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Have you sort of been inspired to want to sort of document this type of thing as well? I mean, this is... I wouldn't say inspired. I would say more like compelled. I just feel okay. I must do something, you know? Yeah. I feel absolutely. But I'm very divided because, you know, the, there are many people who are going there to help. For example, right. check, you know, putting supplies into vans and driving down there. But I'm also mindful that you know, organization is required. So, you know, if, if everyone just kind of floods down there, I'm concerned that it could cause more confusion, you know, that I, so I'm, I'm mindful that we should, you know, if it, that the people who are, you know, people who are organizing all of these things properly are allowed to do so, you know, sure. so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely, I, one of the things that I did do is I thought, um, I start, I did a couple of illustrations, which I thought I could put out there, which um, demonstrate my idea of what the reality of, of it is, you know, but, and, yeah. but then I've seen, I, I don't know if you know about NFTs, you know of what course. those are. Of course. So there's a, an amazing guy called Beeple, and I'm sure everyone is the one now one of the best-selling artists of all time. He's been doing some Putin illustrations, you really, know? and um, they they are very you know thought-provoking and shocking. Um, but I I think you know we have got you know we one of the things this is. It's, it's a bit like the Twin Towers. It's a, a huge moment in history, which it represents a sudden re-emergence of this kind of medieval warlord kind of evil, you know, the, the di dictatorship. 
in this modern age when we all thought like none of that can happen anymore because of the internet and everyone will know what's going on but it's literally like suddenly we have never actually rid ourselves of this mm -hmm. you know the, the that side that side of mankind that does this kind of thing so uh, and you know i come from i've had the most enchanted life you know i was a, a young lad in the 60s um in you know london and it was the you know it was the freedom and then the 70s and you know the absolute explosion of creativity that could only happen in a free society right. so now you you have this kind of guy that wants to bring things back when all that creativity would stop you know and all that endeavor and all that invention just stop it in its tracks purely out of greed and oh, no. wickedness it, so it, it, being creative is very very important at this moment in time you know if you can if we can is it better to, to drive down in a van you know with with you know is that the way you're going to do it or can you do it can you do it through your what you say your power the power that you have what are you most powerful at sure and how can you use that hmm. to kind of flag up how important um freedom of thinking is you know so i i am really I'm, every day i'm thinking what can i do next what what can i do um you know i want to do something physical i feel it will make me feel better if i can actually go and do something and i'm also thinking i have access to the media you know i have milli i can put things in front of millions of people yeah, that's what I should be doing. You know, somebody that's right in the, in your wheelhouse. I know that uh, that I, I'm not sure that you guys have worked together, but I know that he's been an inspiration to you as well. Ken, um, I saw a tweet from David Lynch a few weeks ago, and it, right when the when the invasion started, and um, I felt like that was the perfect vehicle, right? That he has a, a a mechanism in which to get the message out to a lot of people that essentially condemned what Putin was doing uh, without being divisive right that's a huge yeah. part of what's going on right now is that um you know there's there's a divisive message that happens putin has his message yes. that he tells the russian people and they they believe in in that somewhat i think sometimes you know uh, when the as we've seen right the, the the russian army gets into the ukraine they find yeah. out a little bit more about what's really going on and they're abandoning you know shit but um but that's a, a perfect illustration of that right that, that david lynch has the uh, the mechanism in which to get the message out to millions of people, and it gets the conversation started about what other people can do. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you think yeah. about war artists and war photographers, and if you think about Dame Vera Lynn, you know, and what she brought, you know, so yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a somber conversation, but I'm glad to know that that's, you know, at least what has, you know, been kind of going on and the wheels in, in, the, in your brain as this has gone on. Um, you, know, you, you mentioned that, you know, at the onset of this, that people that are watching this, primarily musicians that come to my show, might not know your name necessarily, but they've seen your work. Mm -hmm. So yeah. without, you know, uh, tooting your own horn, if you wouldn't mind, Let's go back to that time, back in the, in the 60s and 70s, when you talked about growing up in London, where mm -hmm. you drew your inspiration, and then what has happened between then and now that has brought you forth in front of millions of eyeballs across the planet? Um, I'll try and keep it short, you know, so it doesn't get too boring here. But, um, yeah, I mean, I was a painter and sculptor, and um, I was fortunate enough to be in the art college system in the 70s you know and in those days you could you'd be i was working i'm a working class lad from birmingham you know so i didn't have the money to go to college but the government being a labor government paid for people to go to college in those days so you didn't have to be rich to have this most amazing education at the same time we had the whole explosion of the music world you know so we had the beatles we had the stones and and we had early pink floyd and early pink floyd to me were it you know it's all i ever listened to sure. um i was given a film project and i started you know with an eight mil camera and then i was putting these films to pink floyd music that's how i began making films um <clears throat> and then 
I started doing animated films and I taught myself and um, I just improved and improved. But there, I think there were two seminal influences on me at that time. One was the um, slit scan sequence in 2001, A Space Odyssey, which was just, it's still incredible. That I mean, that film is incredible. It always will be. But to see that after, you know, an hour and a half of, Kind of realistically portrayed space travel to go into this kind of psychedelic sequence it just you know blew me away <clears throat> and then yellow submarine which is a must much underestimated film which is just an absolute explosion of graphic ideas and and it was a revelation to me too because um there's a sequence in that called lucy in the sky with diamonds that sequence uh, which is a technique called rotoscope where it's all you film something in live action and then you draw it by hand, you know? So that opened the door to me. And then suddenly I was making much more ambitious animated films. There's a program which is quite famous here. I don't know if you've heard of it, which used to be called the Old Grey Whistle Test. And it was run by the, you know, the wonderful uh, Bob Harris, who does a folk music, uh, he's a DJ now, but he's, you know, he, he would showcase experimental animation Pink Floyd saw it. In fact, it was Rick Wright saw my film. And then I got the phone call from my heroes. You know, we want to see your film. Now, I didn't even really know what a film director was. You know, it wasn't in those days, you know, there, there weren't colleges that trained film directors to be directors. So I was very naive. I actually thought I was in trouble. I thought they were going to, like, tell me off. For, for making an animated film to their music. Right. I rented a preview theater in the West End in the famous Wardour Street. If anyone doesn't know, Wardour Street in those days was the kind of Hollywood equivalent in the UK. You know, it was it was the where all the film companies were. They came in and um, very polite, but very quiet. All four of them sat next to me, the insignificant art student, I ran my film, Dave Gilmore sat next to me, drumming his fingers on the armrest. And, and the piece of music was one of these days from the metal album, which it starts with wind blowing and then it goes ring ding 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 It's a great guitar riff. And um, he, I, I had taken out a little piece to shorten the film and He's, you know, as he was listening to this, his fingers stopped and he looked at me and said, did you cut something out there? And I thought, oh, my God, I'm in yeah. real trouble here. But right. I said, yes, I made that fit the animation. And, but, uh, and then they said, well, we want you to do the time sequence for Dark Side of the Moon. And, you know, it's, it's kind of wow now. But then I was like, OK, they've given me a job. I better do this well. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be famous. It's more sure. like, well, how can I make the best possible result from this? What can, what can I do? So I was working for an animation company at the same time. So I left that company, set up my own little mini studio. And with, you know, five or six people did the time sequence, which is all hand-drawn. You know, all the cells are actually, um, you know, drawn with pen and ink on celluloid. And um, but synchronized to the music, um, they showed that at Wembley Arena on the circular screen, which is known as Mr. Screen, by the way, in the business. Um, and and it was a euphoric reaction. And I remember because I'll blow my trumpet, but I was the first first person to create a synchronized film to their music because before that they were using live effects light <laughs> lighting effects lasers and lights right. um and so i remember i know paul mccart paul and linda mccartney were in the audience but everyone in the music business was in that audience i remember looking along the row you know and seeing of course everyone not everyone listen a lot of people were taking a lot of drugs in those days right. um and, and, it, and they were like kind of rocking backwards and forwards. There's all this hair going, you know, and then it was my animation up there on this giant screen with Pink Floyd playing in front of it. 
And all I was thinking was like, mm, do you know, I could have improved that a little bit. And that <laughs> a little bit you know, maybe I should have done this that way. Um, and then, you know, they I got the phone call again afterwards, said we wanted to do the rest of the album. You know, so I storyboarded the entire album, but they went to Pompeii and I think they were away for like eight weeks. Now, the thing is, animation, if anyone doesn't know this already, it's a very slow process. It's very labor intensive. So to produce a remainder of like, you know, nearly 40 minutes of animation, it takes two years to make a 90 minute film. So you're talking a year really to make full animation. I don't think, you know, the Floyd really had any idea how long it took. And I, actually I didn't because I was the new kid on the block. I mean, I'd never been given such a big gig and suddenly I had to employ all these people. And I set up a bigger studio in Dean street and you know, the whole thing was on a much bigger scale. And I, I managed to produce, you know, four tracks of, of animation, um, which was uh, Speak to Me, On the Run, Us and Them, and Time. I didn't quite finish On the Run. Um, so, you know, so what I, I have, actually, I have a lot of unseen footage, no which, um, yeah, hmm. no, I'm not kidding. Um, and, well, uh, well folks, know, we're going to debut it right. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm currently working on a project. I won't tell you what it is, but it's my ambition to fully realize this album mm. in, in animation, you know, and we'll see, you know, where I go with it. But, um, yeah, I mean, and so that, you know, Mike Oldfield saw it. He was there. He called me up. I went to, I became very good friends with Mike Oldfield. Um, I went down to his gothic mansion in the middle of nowhere, which was an interesting experience. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was suddenly like the psychedelic, you know, trippy brain for hire, you know, for all the musicians of the day. I'm going to back you up for just a second, because this is, this is almost too much for me to comprehend, but I'm thinking <laughs> like you were right out of school. Yeah, I was about 23, 24. Yeah. Okay. So you get a call from Pink Floyd that says, we want you to do the, develop the time sequence. When they call you with this, do they say, we'll throw a budget at you. You can hire some guys, you can quit your job. Um, and I, I'm sorry to ask those types of questions, but for me, I think about getting right out of school as a broke college kid, right? Where yeah. um, maybe you have a job at a, in a, a film studio, but thinking about at that point, okay. I have no idea, Kevin. I just, okay. you know, I, I just, you know, I think I paid myself a small amount of money. I wasn't in it for the money. I, you know, it's so, that was 40 odd years ago. You didn't, the way people think now, it's all career opportunity, marketing, how many people like you. I made all those films at that point for no reason other than I was in love with the process. I didn't have any ambition at the end of those creative acts. And that's, actually why I still have a good relationship with the band to this day is because an artist, you know, I listen, Damien Hurst is a fantastic businessman, you know, I'm a, I'm a terrible businessman, really. And maybe mm -hmm. I'm just about learning to be a businessman now, many years on, maybe, but I wasn't, I, I was just in love with making those films. And that's so, so the cost side of it, just about covered it. I didn't walk away from this with shitloads of money. Sure. I think if I'd have asked for 10 times the amount, they probably would have paid me, but I just didn't ask for it. And that's probably why that relationship is still solid, right? With the band, because they saw yes. the passion yes. for it. I um, I ask partially because, and, and Ken knows this well uh, as, as well, but my father also is a painter and a sculptor mm -hmm. and, uh, it, and, um, and and also is a, is a horrible businessman, right? His, his his art is from his heart. It's all about his creativity, and he's an abstract expressionist. Where he grew up and he grew, you know, he he developed his trade in an area that's primarily Western art. So there's a lot of cowboys and horses and that kind of thing. That oh, well, you don't mean Western art? You mean Westerns? Truly oh. Westerns. <laughs> yes, yes. And 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 he was not about to to uh, to go the commercial route. 
and really didn't understand how to market himself. But and his uh, it, when I would talk to him about saying, well, your contemporaries are out there, you know, selling their pieces for millions of dollars. And if you just did this and this and he said, that's not in my wheelhouse at all, you know, and, and I understand. And I think um, that the, that's a, the beauty of it. it in some respects. You mentioned NFTs before and, and uh, bringing digital art to the blockchain and being able to place a value, a, a perceived value on a piece of art, right? Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by NFTs and, uh, and, and really the process right now of placing um, value on a, on a commodity that's in limited form. Yeah. So when you go back to those days where Pink Floyd came to you and said, Ian, um, we see that you've got what represents us our sonic representation to put in a visual form uh, and that's where that pairing happened yeah you mentioned you mentioned that at that point the psychedelic market then saw you you mentioned mike oldfield i saw the tubular bells video i saw the escher influence and i really i loved it i'm a huge mc escher fan i could see that that, that you were too so um as we all know and no matter what industry you're in really marketing networking or, or the who you know is is really uh, an important part of at least expanding yourself into a different audience and so the people like mike oldfield then see you um you maintain your relationship with pink floyd but then what was your your end goal were you just feeling like i just need to express myself I, you saw that animation was something that you wanted to do primarily as a career did you see yourself as a director at that point or uh, it's a filmmaker. really strange, you see, I, I, because I'm, I'm a working class lad from Birmingham, I, you know, there was not, I, the other day I went through, when I finished the first year of my college, I had to think about getting a job, you know, I went to the um, unemployment bureau, you know, and they, I still have it, I still have the job that they gave me that I didn't do, fortunately, <laughs> which was designing tire treads. You know, and it's like I could have been designing tire treads for the rest of my life. That's all they didn't even know what an animator was in Birmingham. I didn't really know that directing was a profession, you know. So now, now my daughter has got a boyfriend and he's got like bloody blah director on the bottom of his email, you know. So now they're training thousands of directors every year from media colleges. I didn't ever imagine being a director um so i just kind of and then i started my own studio and and the jobs kind of came in so i never then i started I, as i was making a bit more money i realized well maybe what i want to do is make proper films you know so i started financing actually live action films you know um so while i was doing the you know the whole animation career was getting out of control because I was so successful. I was using that money to finance my, to self train myself as a live action director and to work with actors and, you know, um, so, you know, the career that followed, um, is been, you know, I've been very successful as a live action director, but my process is essentially animation because I imagine something up front. I do a quick sketch of it. And then I do a more detailed storyboard and then I go and shoot it. And that's, you know, some people work that way. That's the way I work. Ridley Scott works that way. And I've oh. worked in his company for five years, you know. I, I, I is, saw that. that yeah, which yeah, was, I, I'm so glad I work there because I, I work with world-class DOPs and production designers. They used to call his company the Rolls-Royce in the fast lane. Mm, yeah. And, you know. What I learned from him, on top of the, what I learned from animation, and you know, so. Um, but I do think that the UK is a bit slow visually. I mean, the young the young generation of directors are better, but but I was always too visual for everyone in, in the world of live action when I was doing it. You know, not in America. Everyone <laughs> loved what I did in America, but too visual in the UK. Okay. You know, I, I've been quite verbose here and I don't want to, 
um, talk over because right now we're in the wheelhouse of where Ken is. I, I know you're, you've got to be chomping at the bit, Ken, to be asking some technical questions because I know Love you mentioned that. when I when I mentioned uh, about talking to Ian, uh, you had mentioned that uh, a huge inspiration of, of yours going into school came from animation from that that time frame. So you want to talk a little bit about uh, that and and maybe some questions for Ian. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, really nice to meet you, Ian, and, and it's so great to get your backstory here. I, I've watched some of your stuff online. Of course, I've seen all your Pink Floyd stuff. Uh, and as Kevin said, that was really, really watching those animations, uh, the earlier stuff that you did for Pink Floyd. This would be uh, probably about 88. So it was before uh, Endless River, but it was um, just all your classic animation and the wall. When I saw what could be done with music and image and art, uh, just all of that and acting in, in some of those films, uh, that's what set me on my course as a, a film major. And so I was, uh, I was just uh, getting ready to go to college when I got into all this stuff. I was a little late to the game. This was, yeah, 88. So it was, uh, you know, I, I had seen parts of the wall and I'd heard the whole thing, but uh, it was just a revelation to see your uh work you know the uh one of these days and and the dark side of the moon work just what could be done there the geometry and just the art uh the rotoscoping like like you had with the dancers in that yeah. uh just got made me feel like you know maybe i can do this i'm not very good with a brush i'm more of a photography kind of guy i, I i'm a little more closer to real life or live action uh, yes. and, and, and less of a visual artist like like Kevin's dad, but uh, but this is maybe something I could do. And so I enrolled in the film school here in Bozeman, Montana, where where Kevin and I grew up. And I, I got started. And by my junior year, I, I made a, a, a minute and a half animation, which, as you know, even a minute and a half takes a long time. Mm -hmm. It's just on index cards. But um, just trying to emulate some of the things that that you and and the other Pink Floyd animators were doing, you know, like doing uh, morphs between a mosquito and a uh, oil rig, you know, uh, just trying to draw some parallels, things like that, trippy stuff, you know, and uh, and then my senior thesis was an eight minute uh, animated film, and we we had a crew of artists from the art department, we had some filmmakers. Uh, Kevin and I have a common friend, Yaro Craner. He helped with that. And we were doing probably very similar to what you were doing, you know, frame by frame, stopping the projector and tracing the outline of, of whatever motion was going on. Rotoscoping. And then, yeah, rotoscoping. And then, and then just going back and inking and painting those cells. I mean, this was before the digital changeover, you know? So yeah. I feel like we were lucky to get in on the tail end of of some of that real art, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying After Effects and Maya and those things aren't art, but it's a it's a different animal. And, and when we got to do that kind of work that that we saw you and yeah. your contemporaries doing yeah. 20 years later, it was it, it was fun, you know. Yeah, it's hard work too, though. Good to hear. Well, yeah. you've uh, you've uh, learned, you know, you've learned from learned the ropes from you know with your bare hands at the beginning of the process. I mean, I I do enjoy, for example, even editors. I I do prefer to work with people that at some point in their lives have worked on film mm -hmm. and yeah. not really digitally. Sure. But, so, you, you know, having done that, you can carry out through, well, what are you doing now? Oh, uh, so I'm doing, uh, I'm doing mostly uh, video production for Silicon Valley companies, but uh, I do a little bit of After Effects work. And mm -hmm. so I get, I get to keep my hands in animation. Yeah. And uh, someday I want to do another, you know, artistic piece, you know, but it, it's very commercial at this point. Time consuming. You've got to have, and if it's animation, you've got to have the time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, what do you, I'm interested in what you both think about the the transformation in animation with studios like DreamWorks and Pixar, you know, that have gone on to these massive big budget productions with thousands of animators, how you can sort of project manage and take something like that and make, um, you know, this huge sort of global piece do you feel like some of the, the magic is lost or do you still see the magic in what's produced? 
Yeah. Uh, am I bright enough, by the way, Kevin? Because the lights dropped outside big, big oh. time. Oh yeah, well the light you bring is uh, is certainly bright. It's coming from yeah. me, okay. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to answer that, or shall, shall I? Do you want me to? Well, carry uh, on? I'm like I'm you. interested. Yeah, Ian, please. Okay, so I, you know, I think that uh, Pixar DreamWorks, what they do is they, you know, they use previous knowledge in a very beautiful and clever way. You know, so they even those those setups are not. Um, you know, they, they have life drawing, I believe. They use storyboards, you know, they, they integrate the story writing process, storyboard process, you know, so they sort of hang on to those core tactile elements of animation before it goes into the process. They do, you know, um, the kind of uh, production design aspect, the lighting, a lot of that is already you know it's almost like painting it's done even with raw material you know like watercolors and pastels and pen pencils they use all those things before they are, get to the end product um so i think the process is amazing and it's it's just the best in the world well i don't know there's other places in the world doing amazing stuff too but um yeah. but collectively it's the best in the world is what's going on in, in the states in terms of animation I think um, there's been a huge boom in animation, and I—I I mean, for me, I one of the—I didn't really want to be an animator at the beginning, to be honest. I, I didn't, I, and because I thought it was specifically for children, I didn't really mm. consider it as an adult medium. And I still, although I've done a lot of kids entertainment, I do love doing that, you know, and family entertainment. I—I'm still really essentially someone that that wants to make animated films for the adult market. Mm. And that, no, not the adult market, but the grow, you know, the grow. <laughs> sure, right, yeah, and, uh, right. Um, Felix, Felix the cat is what you're, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, it's, more, it's difficult to finance and it's a funny old crossover. I mean, Love, Death and Robots. Is it Love, Death and Robots? You know, I'm, I think I'm really fascinated by the work that they're doing. Um, but, you know, uh, I think it would be good. And I, I'm only interested in innovation. And by virtue of that, I'm generally doing something that may or may not be commercially successful. Mm. You know, whereas I think what's going on in the Hollywood studios, it's more to do, less to do with animation and more to do with what Hollywood is producing. I mean, it's a bit like the Marvel, the superhero. You know, so if I see another superhero film off, you know, I, I just, I'm bored by them right. all. Sure. It's you know, and so that I love animation, but it's so rich, so dense. So it's like, let's go for something simpler. Let's, let's really innovate. Let's not just be digitally amazing all the mm -hmm. time. With, wow, wow, you know, thousands of things coming at you, fast and furious. The more you pour in, the more amazing it is. Let's work with the form. Let's change the storytelling process. Let's look at other ways of telling stories and, and somehow get out of our addiction to HD super detailed imagery. We're going down this road where if you see something simple, you get bored with it, you know? Sure. So I, 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 I'm, 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 th what I want to do always is something that no one else has done before. That inevitably is <laughs> tricky. Um, so sure. I would, it's, a, it's a risk. Hmm? It's a risk. It is. For sure. So, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, what, what I've seen in a number of films for BAFTA, you know, um, one of the films that stuck in my mind, Flea, which is actually about, um, I think they're Afghan refugees that go to Russia. And it's a, some. it's like a documentary, you know, but it's also... You know, um, but I thought that was an amazing film, really, because it, it had a big, very deep emotional purchase to it. Um, you know, I, I love the work that the guys that did Spider-Man and then they did Meet the, the Robots. Um, oh, yeah. You yeah. know, Wally? Well, no, Wally's oh. incredible. I mean, yeah, that yeah, is for sure. Film. Yeah. Um, 
I, I think they innovate, you know, that all of those people are innovating, but, you know, at the same time, you kind of, after 30, 40 minutes, you begin to get so saturated with what you're mm. watching that there's no silence, there's no... Mm. I heard Brad Bird talking about, he likes, you know, Brad Bird is a genius, I think, you know, he's doing really interesting things. So Ratatouille is the most amazing film, I think. And he knows how to, he really, the storytelling is phenomenal, but he knew, knows how to use emotions and silence and atmosphere and, and sort of not try to be overly impressive and too fast and shoe on too much mm -hmm. in. It's proper filmmaking. Sure. So I guess that's what I'm saying in a roundabout way is that you need some kind of deep, you know, insight into life itself in order to be able to make a really amazing animated film. You know, in hearing you talk about that, it makes me look at the parallels with music these days, you know, yes. looking at commercial music and um, me, for me, like desiring an artist that can be timeless, you know, somebody that could be creative and expressive, you know, it's been said that everything musically has been done at some time before. Sure, the, the notes have been played and in the sequence and the arrangements have, have all, you know, been done in some sort of form. But but as a, an artist, when I hear musicians that are really saying something unique, um, you mentioned the attention deficit that, that an audience has. It's certainly that way with the, with music, you know, as well, right? I mean, yeah. we won't find a modern commercial artist that stands the test of time, the way the Beatles have, or the way, you know, a, a, a lot of the artists, Pink Floyd, that we've, we've grown to love, unfortunately, because we've sort of saturated ourselves with music that has, it's maybe satisfied a, a desire or need for a short time, and then you seek out something else, you know, it's just the way that, that you know, our, our minds have sort of um, adapted, but, um, you know, it's, it's it's unfortunate to me, you know, and I really love the idea that using technology gets us in front of a lot of different music. You know, there's there's a lot of new music that you can be exposed to by sort of going down that rabbit hole of, you know, YouTube or, or a Spotify where you can find somebody new that maybe hasn't been forced, force fed, you know, down your throat that you can that you can consume and and value and appreciate and it's kind of just yours you know, the way that pink floyd was for you early on you mentioned you know off the metal record but um they had they hadn't blown up to be dark side or the wall yet right and so the uh, uh my my 20 year old son is very wise beyond his years he was a huge beatles fan at 10 and he's a huge pink floyd fan um he's talked to me a lot about the rift between Gilmore and Waters, you know, uh, over time. And it's been interesting to hear that perspective from a young person, you know, in, in this day and age. Uh, it made me think a lot about the experience you had working with those guys early on. And um, without, without digging too deep for the dirt, what uh, what experience did you have in the, in the early Pink Floyd days where there was maybe some uh, expression of because they saw something in your earlier film work, that, your animation, that they said, we want you to represent us visually. Were you getting input from, say, Gilmore and Waters and Nick Mason? And, or, or where did a lot of that direction come from? Or did they give you creative freedom to do what you wanted? Initially, they, they didn't really explain themselves at all. Okay. Um, and they gave me creative freedom. But then when I, when I produced, yes, they have plenty to say about it. That's always the way. Um, sure, but sure. Um, I think what what they reckon, what I didn't realize, and I, I look back on you know that now and try to analyze what it was that worked. And I think one of the things that worked was that first of all it was synchronized, you know, so they'd never really had, and that's very important because it meant that things were moving in exactly the right moment to their music. The next thing was that it was architectural. That's part of, they, they were architects. They were studying, studying architecture. And I think that um, their music, in my opinion, is architectural. It's, it's, mm -hmm. That's why the concerts were such an important experience because you were in a place where the music was moving all around you and they were making images that were coming all around you. Um, and then also it was kind of metaphorical, you know, whereas I think a lot of the things that they do 
are not, you know, they're big subjects like time, insanity, you know, death. So big, big brushstrokes. So in terms of the actual um, creative process, I always, you know, it was always all of them together for that period of time. And then later on, it, I was either working with David or I was working with Roger, you know, separately. Um, and I never really, I mean, I, I was aware of the personalities, of their different personalities. And you know, David is, um, he's, you know, he's quite, how will I say, um, he's, he's like a compassionate individual. He's, he's very, sense of beautiful, his guitar playing is very emotional, very tender, if you mm -hmm. like. Whereas Roger is much more acerbic, he's much more critical, he's much more ferocious in his creativity. And I think the two of them were the, you know, were the engine. And of course, then you had Rick Wright, who was cerebral, he's a classically trained musician, you know, and so he brought structure to those companies. They're very important, but he was very internal. I think he's... A, Rick Wright, I think, is a much underestimated presence in Pink Floyd. I think he's absolute genius. I love his, you know, keyboard synthesizer playing. Um, and Nick Mason was was the sort of diplomat of the mm. group, and indeed still is, you know. So, um, but you know, fantastically experimental. So, what was and you know, they were serious experimenters, you know, of the time, which is very much of that era. It wasn't about I, I guess, you know, now they talk, I sometimes read things where they say they, they knew they were going to be very successful and all of that, but you just sort of felt, and that was what I was involved with. It was nothing to do with the end game. It was to do with how can we do this? How can we make this better? What can we do that's different? And it was that kind of serious commitment to creativity. Very much, I would say, of the art college system, of Britain in the 70s, and I don't know how much people are aware of this, but the art college system was based upon crits, we called them criticisms. You would go around and criticize each other's work, and then you'd, you know, you'd, you'd argue back or what have you. So it's that kind of group criticism leading to a result. Um, and a lot of famous musicians came out of art college. I mean, um, the Rolling Stones, for example. You know, so uh, in, in the UK um, later, you know, when I worked with um, David and, and with Roger separately, it was really a very informal, very friendly, you know, kind of uh, situation where I, I, I tend to go in in a quite workmanlike way. We, you know, you find this when you're working with top people on the top level, when you talk to Ridley Scott. <laughs> He doesn't want to talk about stars or, you know, famous things or money or, you know, um, walking down the red carpet. He wants to talk about a fantastic new piece of tr tracking equipment that he's just mm. used, it's just a new design, you know, a new kind of bit of nuts and bolts. We all want to talk about the nuts and bolts. You know, we don't want to talk about the glamour. Sure. And, and the guys at the very top don't. They just talk about the mechanics. Roger wants to talk about this amazing new projector that the last time I saw him. It's got super HD, you know, and it's um, those are the conversations I have with them. Uh, I I mentioned to you I think the other night that uh, my son and I are going to both McCartney on this round and and also the Roger Waters show that uh, they'll be yeah. arriving in Portland. Uh, what what do we have to expect for the new Roger Waters tour? Well, listen, I, that, I'm not on a day-to-day -day basis with Roger, so I can't read his mind, but I have been seeing that coming in. Um, you know, I mean, he's he's grown more political over mm -hmm. the years, so I, I'm fairly sure he's going to have a lot to say about Ukraine in, in one way or another, whether it's on the nose directly or whether it's tangentially. I don't know. I don't know what the content is, but you can bet it's going to be it's going to have a, a wallop to it. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I have um, a question I've, I've got to ask you in right now. Okay. So um, we, we, I know that your work was at the Berlin Wall Show back in, yeah. I think, 1990. Uh, yeah. And I assume that you were there as well. Yes. I okay. shot sequences for the wall, like the live That's action right. sequences. 
yes. That's right. That's okay. Fine. So having been there in the environment where the, you know, the wall was about to come down, it was coming down. The real uh, wall. Yeah. The real wall. Yeah. The real wall. Yeah. And then having this, this Russia Ukraine thing bubble up. Out, I mean, not out of nowhere, but the intensity of it. Uh, I mean, in a way, Putin was kind of hiding in plain sight all this time, right? But yes. oh, uh, this time. I mean, it's it's been a kick in the gut to all of us. But I would imagine, especially you, who were right there when when that wall was coming down. And I just want to ask you about that. You know? Yeah, I mean, I again, I have no idea. You know what I was going into i mean that is a that's a movie alone that experience of working on that film on that concert because um it was in you know it then the wall had only just come down and 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 it was in a, an area called potsdamer platz right. i don't know if you know about this but potsdamer platz was the no man's land originally between east and west germany so it was a strip of barren land which was originally between the two you know the the wall was actually two walls wasn't it they you know so there was a gap between them um and i east berlin had only just been vague you know we i went into east berlin to film sequences for the concert and it was deserted you know sure. we were driving around an empty city we went into a hospital to film a sequence, um, you know, a hospital sequence. Um, and the beds were still, the blankets were just turned over, you know, as if people had got up and run out of the place. It was a very strange atmosphere. Um, I took the marching hammers um, on, on, we had a flatbed truck with um, a load of roadies, you know, long haired kind of you know, hippy dippy roadies driving this flatbed truck with a giant projector on it, driving through East Berlin, and I was projecting the marching hammers onto the what remained of the Berlin Wall and refilming it. And we had an East German police escort. So we had this kind of Nazi hammers marching along the Berlin Wall, projected, you know, with this kind of East German police escort. It's a pretty bizarre experience. Um, yeah. It was, it's a really, you know, for me, I mean, I've, I've somehow I've, I've had quite a lot to do with Eastern Europe over the years. And I got a very, my father was there, you know, and for a while in Hungary. And um, I feel very connected to Eastern Europe. And um, the other thing that's coming back up is the threat of nuclear war. You know, so there's the whole, I remember what that happened big time in the seventies. There was a film called the war game, which recon recreated what would happen if a drum bomb was dropped on London. And I was, I was with my, um, current, she's my wife now, but she's my girlfriend then. And we just, we were going to go and live in on Northern Ireland somewhere away from you. We were terrified, Yeah. you know, but this time I feel. I feel we really just, the, what we have to do is we have to, it's made it even more important to appreciate freedom of thinking. Sure, sure. And that's what comes out of this, is how important freedom of thinking is. Because freedom of thinking created the vaccine, you know, the vaccines. It, it, it enables people to collaborate, to invent, to find ways to solve problems, not just artistic, but scientific and, you know, in engineering, in every walk of life, freedom of thinking is all about endeavor and it's about improvement and sure. communication. And, and so in, although it's terrifying and it's shocking and it's horrible and I'm crying every time I see the news, I've never cried so much in my life when I'm seeing. Yeah. But it's making me think how important it is to be creative and to share that because people want it, you know. People need to feel part of everybody else. Mm. We need each other, you know. Um, and the, the creative process is a way of sharing that experience. And music, be you know, because, yeah. I mean, 
even in uh kevin even that that you know little gig that we you we were met at the other yeah. night the feeling those people you know they they were they so came together it was really important you know I, honestly I, I gotta tell you um i don't take any of that for granted you know and i, I mentioned that it was a, a silly little gig but what it did was um, it brought me into an, in a, in an environment that you and I could have a conversation. And yeah. and even before we had a vi- verbal conversation, there was a visual and there was a sonic conversation that happened. You know, every single person in that room, thankfully, I could see them, right? When we played like a massive arena, I can only see the first two rows, right? So it, 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 there could be 20,000 people there and I could only see the first 50 people. So the fact that we had this room where I could see everybody's face, I know that the pandemic starved a lot of people for that expression yeah. and that communication, that conversation. And and this, my show, this podcast really was born of the need to do that. It was a conversation that my guitarist and I had about, boy, you know, we may not have the opportunity to go out and play for the next two or three months, right? Had not having any idea that this is going to go on as yeah. long as it had. And so when we've been able to go back out, you can see how vibrant people are and how starved they have been for the the, the feeling of having this communal thing. Yeah. And so I, it doesn't matter the size of the venue. I was, I was laughing a little bit about the environment that we could meet. Right. And I had no idea who you were. Um, I saw the connection there that I saw you watching. I think what it was when I, when I first came to talk to you, I'd asked if you brought earplugs, right? Because you were, right in front of our keyboardist mm-hmm. right our singer right he was you could reach out and grab his leg probably and you know pull his his keyboard over um it's a strange environment for a rock show but um i was so grateful for it and what it did was uh, you know i think for me with in in a music situation and i don't know if it's this way with film but a lot of times there's a barrier there's a separation between the performer and the audience and, and I dislike that because I'm a huge consumer of music. I love music. I also love to be able to communicate with people. So when I'm coming out after a show, I'm not there to quote unquote meet a fan. I, I don't consider fans at all. I really feel like people that come buy tickets or, or travel or get hotel rooms or babysitters to come to a show, they're new friends, right? And, and it's an opportunity to make a connection. And that really resonates with me when you talk about how people need to see the the freedom of expression it's also this communication that essentially we are all the same underneath you know when you look at uh, a russian family who's you know lost their their families and and past altercations and they're losing their husbands to or wives to war um going off to fight a a, a battle that they're being brainwashed to fight I feel as strongly for those families as I do for the people in Ukraine that are being attacked, you know, and and so there's so much that I think can that can be attained by positive communication and listening. And I I really see you having that vehicle, you know, to be able to do that in, in, in your terms of expression. You mentioned using your vehicle to to illustrate, and you said you put together a couple of illustrations where they are they satirical in terms of like the the, the Putin point or, or tell me a little bit about the illustrations that you came up with well actually one of them I put up on Instagram and uh, it's not up now but I, I put it up um, a few days back um, and it was called insanity you know and it's essentially an image of what's in Putin's brain which is okay. so that so that you have the little tiny putin with his cabinet at the bottom and then out of his head is coming this plume which is an atomic bomb wow. and in the cloud of the atomic bomb are the eyes of putin so what i'm saying is that in in this one man's little head exists you know the end of the world you know the holocaust not the holocaust the, you know the the, the end mm-hmm. of mankind as we know sure. it so um, that and it was it was very kind of lots of red and gold and, and, and nuclear missiles firing off and it's it's quite a disturbing thing to do. I'm I'm actually working on a couple more of those, but I, what I'm thinking now is that shock tactic 
with an image is not necessarily the way because I think there's a lot of that out there but something which is more emotive and more tender, you know, and more th emotional in, in, in its purchase. So, yeah, I mean, uh, an image can say more than a thousand words. And that's one of the things that I'm thinking. I, 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 you know, I almost wondered, is there an image that I can make that would be reproduced, that would somehow encapsulate this notion of how important freedom of thinking is could that image infiltrate somehow into into russia you know could we can can a graphic image somehow penetrate you know um this dictatorship and be reproduced and and somehow make something you know through you you've got a lot you know, you've got an army of people that believe in you that you've worked with, you know, in the past. I would imagine as, as someone who's created a, an assemblage of, of editors and animators and, and yeah. film filmmakers, I would imagine your, your voice could, could be, could be heard worldwide for sure. Yeah. I'd love, I, um, you know, some of the, the focus, and I think about some of the artists that you've worked with in the past, how the yeah. focus has really been about peace, you know, um, I was uh, in Chester, UK yesterday. Um, I took a, a stroll through the the the, um, the old Roman walls and the cathedral there. And in the cathedral, there was an art exhibition, and there was a particular piece that was in there um, called "Pity of War," and there was uh, you know this 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 um, hanging head, uh, blindfolded, just you know just the the distraught feeling. Uh, but it was really essentially just a call for peace and, and, you know, in an environment that was supposed to be peaceful. Some of the artists that you've worked with in the past, McCartney, mm -hmm. you know, the Beatles obviously had um, been seeking yeah. peace in a lot of ways, especially as the, the band evolved and went over time and, and, and sought, you know, went to, to India and you know, looked at, you know, different peaceful sort of direction. Um, how did it happen? It was a, sort of a, a natural progression for you to end up working with Paul and Linda in the 70s. They, actually, they were at that concert, I think, the time, you know, where, the, where my animation was projected and they called me, you know, so I, I, they, they said that um, they had a, um, a music track called The Oriental Nightfish and they wanted me to make an animated film. In fact, there were two. There was one called Seaside Woman, one called The Oriental Nightfish. I could choose one of those two. I chose The Oriental Nightfish. And, and with that, what I decided, I mean, I was getting a lot of offers, you know, but um, I decided to go for working with Paul and Linda, you know, and um, to make the best film I've ever made in my entire life. So, mm. you know, it's kind of a hidden gem, this film, The Oriental Nightfish. It hasn't been seen by many people, but um, it was, it was, I pushed the technical aspect of animation further than I'd ever done. And, um, and it precedes digital animation. At the time, um, I, 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 was, I was doing a project in the States and I went, a, a, a guy, a producer, an animation producer, wanted to show me the first digital animation. He took me to a place so bizarre it was kind of like in a desert somewhere. It was like three giant hangars called, I think it was Information International Incorporated, I think it was called. And um, it was just like room after room of computers. And then they took me to this little cutting room and then they showed me what was the first digital animation and, and said, Ian, you could have, you, you know, you'll be able to do it that way. And I, I you know, so I, I'd reached the kind of pinnacle technically I, I, it was shown at the Cannes Film Festival. I remember a woman saw my hand-drawn animation and said, oh, that's Ian Eames, he works with computers. So, no, mate, I did it all by hand with airbrushing and what have you. And then I just, so I thought, do you know what? I've got one more film left to do. It's going to be really simple. It's going to be directly drawn on paper with pen. And then I moved, and then I basically moved out of animation into live action full time. Really? Okay. Because I felt that I'd reached that point that 
I had to make the transition. And if you think about it, early digital animation is pretty awful. You know, those, those um, pre-Toy Story, that all that digital animation I thought was quite horrible to look at. You know, it was all very plastic and mm -hmm. shiny. And, you know, um, when I saw Toy Story, I was in L.A. directing a film and I just thought, fuck, excuse me, I shouldn't have said that. Yes, um, all right. This is it. You know, this is digital animation has arrived. Mm -hmm. You know, and, I, and then I thought, but that was 15 years later and I would have been doing all this, you know, transitionary digital stuff, which looks... I don't know how, um, whether anyone ever watches early digital animated films anymore. I don't know, but um, they weren't attractive, you know, in, in sure. the, even in the formulative times. That, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, it's kind of like, um, it's odd, you know, it's odd looking and people think it's humorous, you know, but it's... Um, I do. I feel like I'm working on. I, I work with animators. I've done a lot of digital stuff as well, man. And even the live action stuff. You know, you mentioned early on about how precision and rhythm was important to you. I remember the chauffeur. You know, the Duran Duran video. Was that your first live action music video that you produced? Um, probably yes. Yes, okay. I think I've made a couple of small ones before. But that's really an animated film, again, although it's in live action. But what happened there, I storyboarded it, you know, I listened to the music, I broke it down into frames. It was all precisely filmed, frame by frame. Um, but I had the good fortune to, um, my secretary found this DOP called Gilly Taylor, who was um, one of the grand, you know, DOPs of the UK who had actually shot the first Star Wars and um, he also had shot Polanski's movies, the black and white movies. So he'd shot um, Repulsion, Cul-de-sac, you know, and, and so he had, I, I, I was going to make that an animated, um, I was going to make it into an animation by rotoscoping that black and white film with the intention of rotoscoping it all into animation. So, but because Gilly Taylor shot the black and white footage on, I remember it's Ilford stock. It's absolutely beautiful, 35 mil film. Absolutely looks gorgeous today, you know, yeah, and timeless. Um, it, it looks so great. And when Duran Duran saw it, they said, well, forget about the animation. We'll just take it as a black and white film. Mm. So I never progressed to animation with it. I, I, it does. It was. I remember seeing that, um, you know, as a teenager, and it's a very sexy video for sure. Uh, but going back and seeing it later on, realizing how much of the rhythm is in there, even the way yeah. that's shot, the shadow. Yeah, I edited it as well. The shot, I mean, it's shot with rhythm in mind. There are, yeah. it's, it's not even just the cut sequences, but the, yeah. you've got shadows dropping in on drum beats and I yeah, thought, right. it, it, in, in, in a whole bunch of different scenes. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah. It's stuff that I never noticed, even as an early drummer. And I didn't yeah. pick up on that until later on. It's genius. It's really. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I had a steam deck, it was called in those days, where you had you, you cut on a steam deck. It was a flat deck. You had your rolls of film going through the gate. And I edited it myself, that film, frame by frame, you know? So um, it was all very precisely cut as well to the music. Amazing. That, what's, oh, yeah, go ahead, Ken. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I wanted to ask you about influences when you were working on one of these days. Uh, obviously, it was it, I mean, I didn't know this until you said today, but that this was sort of the first use of syncopated images and, and music in the psychedelic world. Um, I know that, you know, Fantasia. Yeah, it's psychedelic. And then, you think you just take some drugs and it just comes out your head. And then, <laughs> that's you know, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and not that mind business of sitting down and doing it frame by frame <laughs> over, over six months, no. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's so much. But I, I know what it takes to score out to every 24th of yeah. a second uh, a Pink Floyd song or any any song. Yeah. And, and I know that, uh, that that's probably the same process they had to go through with Fantasia. Uh, were there other influences uh, between Fantasia and one of these Oscar days? Fishing, yeah. I'm sorry. The work of Oscar Fishinger. 
Oscar Fischinger. Oh, Oscar. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oscar uh -huh. Fischinger. He's one of the first interpreters of music, you know. But he 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 did it with oil paintings on glass, wow. and he he he's the father, the grandfather of musical inter, you know, visual music, musical interpretation into images. Okay. So, so that was a big influence on me. Yeah. Did he, so he's probably pre yeah he probably predated fantasia i would imagine yes i yes. think this tried to work with oscar fishinger on uh -huh. the fantasia sequences some of the okay. more abstract ones uh -huh. and uh you probably saw the salvador dali outtake uh, up from fantasia that was really something i kind of wish they left it in there but I get, I, I get it. Why in the forties that would have been? Yeah, I mean, Fantasia was it's another big film for me. I, I have a book um, here, and uh, I've got my little studio just to show you guys. It's cool. I, maybe I'm not meant to advertise books. Look, it's so old and ends covered. It's the art of Walt Disney, right? Oh, beautiful. And this, it's just it's a it's a bible of animation you know and i i everything i did i i read this book from cover to cover it tells you everything you need to know it's just unbelievable you know that walt disney is a major influence on me too okay. and pinocchio particularly mm. which i believe is possibly his best film mm -hmm. well and of course you dumbo know, but, the you know um pink elephant Let's go ahead. Yeah, the dance of the pink elephants, and you know, I for me that's one of my, of course, because it's psychedelic. Exactly. <laughs> you know, um, I I love that the so the way it all works, the music, it's all going. You know, the, those guys have sat down, taken the music first, I suspect, and then interpreted it into scenes and then you know done it perfectly to that music mm -hmm. they've broken it down frame by frame and i know a quote where they said the guys who did it said we didn't take drugs guys all we ever had was a martini at the end of the day uh -huh. it's and it's surprising, a psychedelic it? sequence you could sit if you want to see it, by is. it stands up to anything in the 60s or 70s i think yeah you know yeah you know, it's, it's great sequence. It, it's interesting to me. I mean, I think about abstract expressionism. You know, I think about your history as an artist, as a visual artist, um, Ian, and that translation. You know, painting, sculpting, and and working into you know this visual, like the the film, whether it be animation or or live action. And then now, looking at the way that things are going, you mentioned wanting to kind of get away from high. Um, uh, high resolution sort of digital effects and, and just the overwhelming sort of gratuitous stuff and getting back to uh, to something meaningful and um, and sort of sentimental, emotional. Uh, Soul was uh, the most recent animated film that I saw. Have you had a chance to see it? Which one? It's called Soul, S-O-U-L. Oh, yes, it's brilliant. That was one of the one of the real game changers for me. That one to me, yeah. I felt like uh, yeah. articulated exactly what you mentioned. That it is yeah. uh, much more than an animated film by far. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. What's a film that you wished you had done in the past? Oh, would have, could have, should have. I don't do yeah. that. Okay, yeah, no. <laughs> all right, no, that's good. I, I'm that I'm that guy too. Um, how about your time with Ridley Scott? I'm interested to know about that that five year span that you had with Ridley. Well, I was making commercials for him, you know. Okay. So, but uh, you know, I had my own. It was great because he has this building in the West End, you know, which is goes. You know, he's got a place, his own place at the top, and he has all these production companies there. And so you had this very kind of like it was the top production company, commercials production company. So, and there was an amazing. A woman called Joe Godman, who was a legend, and she was the main producer, manager of that floor. And it was like old school, you know, in a way. It was old school, but always, you know, the latest technology. So um, I think I learned so much. It was like going, I, I, I love 
being in places where you have a lot of talent working together on their own projects, like an art college type environment. So it was like going back to art college for me. And, you know, uh, if you heard of Chris Cunningham, he's a fantastic mm -hmm. director. He's done some very strange, I haven't heard of him lately. So I had David Bailey on one side in his office, who's the famous 60s photographer um, who was making commercials. And I had Chris Cunningham there, you know, and I, I had, you know, you were just daily meeting the creme de la creme, you know, in terms of technicians, uh, crew, and, you know, um, the kind of people that do it's the nuts and bolts of filmmaking. Um, and it just it took me up at another level on the live action side of things. I'm sure. That's, what's to you in your mind? Because what I, you know, of course, our, our, it's, uh, it's subjective, right? So, but in your mind, what's the greatest Ridley Scott movie created? I think the first Alien. Ah, uh, yeah, well, probably the greatest horror movie of all time for sure. Right in my yeah. mind. Yeah, that's a. How about you, Ken? What's your favorite Ridley Scott? Well, I like Alien for sure, but I'm a little partial to Blade Runner just yeah. because of the ground that it broke and and just I don't know just some of the visuals in it and the emotions and sometimes the lack of emotion, the whole android. Yeah, if I'm really truthful, I, I I couldn't decide between the two. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I love Blade Runner also. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know, and it's changed in focus completely. But I just remembered you mentioned the Roman Polanski connection. Uh, you know, when you talked about the chauffeur, I could certainly see a Polanski influence in that, you know? So was that, uh, did that come from? He was a big, I, I saw all his films. I love Polanski's okay. work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I'm also, most of all, a David Lynch fan. Yes. Oh. You know. You know, it, I, it, I, and I met him, you know, and uh, he was, you know, I, I just, uh, he's a, such a big influence on me. Oh, and genius as well. I yeah. and so a uh, so, uh, dear friend of mine who has worked with David a lot in uh, uh, the I, I think he worked Lost Highway soundtrack and a lot of the Twin Peaks work. Yeah. Uh, John Neff, a music producer, is mm -hmm. one of my next guests on the show here. I'll be back in Portland oh, yeah. interviewing him next month. So yeah, mm -hmm. I uh, and he has remarkable stories about working with David Lynch and. He's the one that pointed me to David's tweet the other day about Ukraine, and yeah. I was I was grateful for it. You know, I think we need people like that, you know, to to be a sounding board for for people to kind of wake people up. You know, yeah. and, as yeah. filmmakers, you know, I'm not uh, a creator in the film world by any means, but talk about groundbreaking. You know, I don't know, you know, somebody who was really you talk. We talked about risk earlier and groundbreaking. Like, uh, like I think of guys like Tarantino, you know, who broke ground and he's very creative and, and you know, um, influential in a lot of ways, but a lot of his work has been gratuitous. Whereas David Lynch was um, a lot was uh, inferred, you know, it wasn't, you know, you, it was more about suspense and, and anticipation of what might happen. Right. And um, so I, I think uh, I, I, I like to take most from David Lynch are those moments in time where you enter a sort of alternate universe of tension fear mm -hmm. and surrealism you know sure, sure. that that's uh seen in blue velvet where dean stockwell is singing into the microphone mm -hmm. uh the candy colored clown or i think it is mm -hmm. or uh, it's so weird i love it it's you know, <laughs> the tension between the characters it's why is it so wonderful? I don't know. I, 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 you know, I mean, Robert Blake and Lost Highway. You know, I think about like the 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 casting that went along with Lynch's movies too is really fascinating to me. You know, but I I mm. uh, I think the the risks that uh, that those filmmakers took uh, very similar to risks that uh, you know the music that we we love so much. You know, I think uh, Pink Floyd because you did so much work with them in the past um, in I think about early Pink Floyd, and you said that they had made quotes later that they said that they would knew they knew they would be hugely successful, but it was very experimental, you know, at the beginning, and it didn't seem to me like they were trying to cross into Not a commercial there. realm at all, you know. I think yeah. when 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 Roger did Dark Side of the Moon, he knew what was going on then. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But by metal, you know, when when metal, you know, came out, that was. 
that was a risk, right? I mean, there was that yeah. was like like fully that was ink on canvas and and just painting uh, expression, you know. Do you still uh, do you still put uh, pen to paper and 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 paintbrush to canvas at all? Do I? Yeah. You asking me that question? Do I yeah. put pen to paper and what? And and paintbrush to canvas. Are you still uh, do, doing any of that? Uh, that you're. Your oh, work? you mean do I still draw by hand? Yes, of course. Yeah. That's how Not, I always will. You know. Um, no. I, I I very often start with some you know very I love uh, pen ink and watercolor because it's very crude and very tactile and then I might scan it and then I start working on so I go from raw materials through to Photoshop you know okay. so I I'm working always with both ends of the spectrum high tech low tech nice that was, that's a it's a beautiful transition that you've been able to make and you mentioned nfts so is that the next next phase then we take uh ian Eames. just made six new nfts mate yes really uh, okay yeah. so uh, it's so my, first, my first and i have no idea you know my, uh, uh, how it will go but um it's of my world and you will probably recognize it being of my world when if and when you see them Fantastic. So we can, uh, we'll find those in the blockchain. And I'm guessing that we can see your illustrations. You mentioned some of the stuff you released on Instagram, but are we able to get uh, your short films, links to your animations and all those well, at the link below? You have my website. Yeah, ianames.com. Um, and, you know, I've only, I've only, I've started using Instagram because of the NFTs. Beautiful. You know, so I, but I've only really just started an Instagram account, so I'm using it. You know, that's going to be a way. What I love about Instagram is the artist community. Sure. So sure. I'm sort of just in the process of discovering Instagram, really. Um, and I'm going to use that as a way of unearthing my archives, you know, um, because there's a lot of work I did prior to the Pink Floyd, which I think is interesting you know which led to that point um and i i really love being part of an artist community that's a really important thing for me it's it's what brought you you know to yeah. the rest of the world i think uh, yeah. you know uh, so people don't have to track you down at a dinner theater in london to be able to to mm -hmm. find out about your work they can actually go to ianames.com uh, yes. i know that you're you're highly revered they, the, when i look at um uh, you know some of the recommendations out there from prominent directors and, yeah. and filmmakers they're 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 regarding you highly um i happen to be in your neck of the woods again next week we're at new cross and uh, uh so if you're able to make it on uh, april 3rd i would love to be able to to guest you and have a little uh, sit down your wife was so charming too so i'll, I'll promise to bring earplugs next time and uh, don't have to blast you guys out okay love to i'd love to hear from you kevin so, okay, fantastic. I'll, I'll drop you a note, and I really yeah. I want to thank you so much for sharing this. You know, I knew uh, the, the moment we spoke that there was a fascinating story, and we didn't even get to the story about uh, these wonderful um, awards that you've got behind you there on the on the wall. What uh, what did I see right behind your head there? You see uh, three BAFTA awards there. Okay. Yeah. And you it, like. Those um, and you also had an Emmy nomination. What was that for? Yes, that was um, a couple of years ago. I made a series called Queens of Mystery, okay. um, which is on Acorn Television in the states at the moment. Okay. And I think that that that's six ninety-minute episodes, of which I directed four. I was the lead director. The Queens of Mystery was, you know, it was a great gig because. Um, it's it's a murder mystery, but I what I was did was they gave me enough freedom to create this kind of alternate world. It's kind of like a chocolate box view of England, but a little bit too beautiful. Okay. With all these murders going on, and, you know, it's a bit it's a bit like a David Lynch concept. You know, you've got this beautiful England, you've got the white picket fences and the blue skies, and then you go down to the lawn and you go through the grass and there's worms writhing and there's mm. nasty things going on on the surface. Beautiful. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so, I think I, 
I need to be binging that on this tour. Mm -hmm. that, that, yeah. I'll, I'll dig so that I'm one doing, up. I'm doing storytelling films, but I'm also doing art. Uh, not enough hours in the day, mate. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, tell me about it. Yeah, well, hopefully you could share a couple of those hours and join me in London next week. Uh, bring your okay. one, bring your beautiful bride out. And Ken, I thank you on a short notice jumping in and, and throwing some uh, some oh. questions Ian's way. I, I knew you that. You too, Ken. Yeah, yeah, this is wonderful to get to talk to you in, in person here, sort of. <laughs> it's uh, a pleasure. Folks, if, if you came here late, go back to the beginning. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Then you can go to ianeams.com. You can find out where you can purchase Ian's NFTs off the blockchain and uh, and see some of his earlier work. And then hopefully we're going to see that new project that you promised to uh, to realize some of the unseen footage that you had done uh, from uh, those Pink Floyd. And you can albums. find me on Instagram, Kevin. As, absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll make sure that we add your Instagram link okay. to uh, this page on Access Kevin. So accesskevin.com. You can see the whole bit. Ian Eames, thank you so much. And Ken Glenn, thank you for being Pleasure. here. Pleasure. And you guys have a wonderful week. And uh, and I look forward to talking to you in person soon.